Delighted to be here. Now, this story is based on a true story you uncovered some 30 years ago. I think it's true. I can't verify it. It doesn't really matter because it's fiction anyway. But it's, uh, it's a story I heard about 30 years ago. A guy told the story in a group, and it stuck with me. And it's, um, it happened in Mississippi in the 1930s. One prominent man killed another and would never, and made no effort to get away, um, accepted his punishment and went to his grave and never gave any clue as to his motive. And it's just a fascinating story. I think it's true. Uh, it could be false, but the guy who told the story told it's true. And, uh, I just remembered it. Well, it, what's really fascinating about this book is exactly that, the motive, which is not revealed until the end. So it's not really so much a who done it as a uh, why why they did you it. You know who done it right off the bat yeah. uh, in the first chapter, it, the question of why. It, as, a, as a novelist, my challenge was to try to take the reader all the way to page 500 before you know why. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it, so it's really... It's kind of cruel to string the reader along, there. <laughs> but it was, uh, it, it was really a, a, a gratifying book to write. How many stories have you uncovered that are still waiting to be told by Mr. Grisham? Oh, uh, it changes every day. I mean, something could happen today that would inspire me to write a novel about, you know, I deal with the law and legal issues and legal injustice and all the problems we have in our criminal justice system. That's where, that's where I hang out and I still really enjoy that. And there's a lot of frustration um, as a citizen, as an observer, because we have so many problems that could be fixed if, uh, easily if we would do so. And so I'm, I keep hammering away at these problems. Uh, the, this is a long list. And again, it, something could happen today that will inspire a book next year. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the process, if we could, a, a little bit of uh, writing a book, because uh, often uh, I read that uh, you'll give, uh, I guess, your manuscript or that to your wife to, to read over and get her reaction. She's re I'm writing now. I start writing every year on January the 1st. I start the next book on January the 1st and give myself six months, roughly. Um, so I'm in Toronto, so I'm out, of, I'm, out, I'm out of the house, and she's reading the first 150 pages. Okay. But I started January the 1st, so, and I'll, I'll go home tonight, and we'll discuss that, and she'll read sections of it from now until June. And, and you'll get her honest opinion, the unvarnished truth. Oh, I don't want her opinions, but I get them, yeah. yeah. She, 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 she reads with a red pen, and she, oh my. Oh, she loves to, oh, she's cruel. And, well, uh, didn't she red pen up one of your books that you, you tackled, a sex scene? Well, she's always said that men cannot write sex, and she's probably true. So I was writing a book 15 years ago, and had these two characters, and I thought, let's just go ahead and have sex. And so I wrote this scene that I thought was pretty erotic. I thought it was very well done, okay? And it was, you know, I, I enjoyed writing this scene. And so for fun, and I, I gave her the next section, and I left the, left the room, and, and she will not read if I'm anywhere near her. She'll go upstairs, I can stay in the house, but, but I, I can't be around her. And I sneaked around later, and I heard her laughing at my sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> Not just, she was howling, okay? She said, you think this and is... red marketing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> she flung it at me and said, you, men cannot write sex, and you really cannot write sex because you don't know much about it. And so we had, a, we had a big fight, and that was my last sex scene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, you have also told aspiring writers not to use a thesaurus. Just throw it away. Why is that? I use it every day. Well, you, yeah. Advice is easy to give and easier to ignore. My point is, so often, um, young asp aspiring writers use words that are not, should not be used. There, there are three types of words, words we all use, words we know, uh, words, words we, we shouldn't use, and words nobody should use. Okay. And a lot of writers to impress with their jaw-breaking vocabulary <laughs> use big words. And to me, the trick in finding the right word is a short word that's two or three syllables that's a bit unusual that you'll recognize and uh, that it's always a challenge to find those good words. But, but I stay away from the sources. Hmm. Of all your books, do you have a favorite? Uh, probably the a Time to Kill, the first one. It was written at a time, it was written 35 years ago, and I was very young. It was very autobiographical because I was that lawyer in that small town in Mississippi dreaming of the big case, the big trial, the big verdict all the attention, and I wanted to be a big-time courtroom lawyer. That was my uh, dream back then, and so I, I wrote this book, you know, featuring that character, and so it's autobiographical. It's also 
uh, a book that didn't sell. It was a total flop when it was published 30 years ago. And nobody saw A Time to Kill until The Firm came out 18 months later and became popular. And then people realized there was an earlier book. And now it's the best-selling book of all of them. Well, listen, uh, 40 books later, the uh, latest is out now. It's entitled The Reckoning from the great John Grisham.